Yours, Lord, is the greatness and the power, and the glory and the majesty and the splendor, for everything in heaven and earth is yours. May your grace be upon us as we humbly offer you our worship service. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing His mercy and His grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare us a place. When we all, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing, we'll sing and shout the victory. And shout the victory. While we walk the pilgrim pathway, clouds will overspread the sky. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow is not a sign. When we all, oh, when we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all, oh, when we all see Jesus, we'll sing and we'll shout the victory.
Namaste, habari ya asubuhi, marhaba, magandang araw. Brothers and sisters, family and friends, visitors, welcome to ICOC, International Churches of Christ, UAE. It is not a coincidence that you and me are part of this podcast today. Whatever you're going through right now and whatever you're doing, I want you put them aside. Listen to the word of God. Focus to the message today. I assure you of wisdom, encouragement, and peace of mind after the service. Without further ado, let me call up Janet for the scripture and word of encouragement to begin with. Thank you, Angelo. Good morning, brothers and sisters, family and friends. I am thankful and grateful that we are able, we are privileged to gather today to worship and honor our God. I know that we have been busy, occupied, and distracted, especially with the things that are going on around us. But today, God is telling us to look away from that and, uh, you know, focus on Him. In Psalm 37 verse 4, it says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and He will give the desires of your heart. You know, taking delight in the Lord means that, you know, our hearts truly find peace and fulfillment in Him. The world may, you know, sell us the idea that status, wealth, and material possession fulfill us. But we all know that no one but God, no one but God satisfies the deepest need and longing of our hearts. So always remember this truth. God satisfies the longing soul. And the hungry soul, he fills with good things. Have a blessed day to you all. Back to you, Angelo. Thank you, Janet, for sharing the scripture. Today, we have an awesome lineup. Francis and Elma will lead us to the cross for the communion. Andrew will deliver the sermon. And uh, Robert and Oxel will close the uh, worship and the announcements. And uh, let's bow our head for to, to pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your encouragement, Lord God. Thank you for your protection. Thank you for the entire week of uh, blessing and guidance, Father. May you continuously uh, provide guidance with us all throughout the service, Lord God. May you send your Holy Spirit to the person who will stand before us, Father, and uh, continuously protect us, Lord God, against this pandemic, Lord God. Whoever is not part of this um, podcast, Lord God, may you continue encouragement, Lord God. We love you, Lord, and we pray this in Jesus' name today. Amen. Oh, 
yearn for you, and deep from within I burn for you. You are my heart and my passion. You are my soul's great delight. You are my truth and my love. You are my Good morning, everyone. For Christians around the world, the celebration of communion is something we have in common. We might call it by different name, communion, Passover meal, the Lord's Supper. When we come around to a time of communion, we have the bread and the wine. However, these two symbolize something bigger and much more important than bread and the wine. But before that, I would like my beautiful wife to share. Good morning everyone and um, this is my story. I was reached out by my classmates during my college days and took me six months or so studying the Bible, giving up the sins of pride, ego, arrogance, selfish ambitions, and boyfriend relationships are the huge hindrances following Jesus. Nevertheless, the perseverance and faithfulness of the sisters and the genuine friendship relationship they built upon me, it furthered me in a new level of decision to become part of the family. I was baptized July 7, 1996. I had been part of the campus ministry for four years and last two months ago, I celebrated my 25th silver jubilee with my journey with God. After campus ministry, my transition to single ministry was incredibly fruitful. From career promotion, fruits added soul where I work, two brothers and one sister added and had been part of the Bible talk leader and got married to a brother I was once prayed for beyond my dreams, Francisca C. Since 1996 up to now, my journey of following Jesus has been a roller coaster of progression with ample of twisting of my dreams. My thank yous for the answered prayers and during my Gethsemane moments. One of the highlights of my journey is in my married life. The conviction that I have had been tested of having a special child, Alex. And during those times, I had so many questions. God, why us? And my husband, Francis, has been working here in UAE, consequently, not physically together on handling this kind of task of parenting was extremely exhausting and after a year Francis my husband left the church and some of my closest and best friends in the church left as well the anguished tears of my soul and doubtful of my heart I asked God in audacious manner on how will I continue my journey with Him? It's too much for me to carry, and the only answer I got from Him was in Hebrews 12 too. Let us fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before Him endured the cross, scorning its shame, and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And with this scripture, has been my constant reminder to be joyfully faithful and persevere of carrying my cross daily. Teach me to be joyful and grateful of my daily walk in every way, of taking care of Alex, of serving my husband, serving my physical and Christian family as well. And in 2014, four of us 
transfer here in UAE another answered prayer of a complete family. Worshiping God together and God used our brothers Dennis and Jacob for my husband Francis to get back on track again and was restored July 8, 2015. And in 2019, with the help of children's ministry workers, Franz Louis C. become a disciple too. There is so much more to be shared, but to summarize all of good work I did for God and for others were indeed rewarding. May they notice, appreciate it or not, God is watching all the time. But I know my journey is not over yet because it is a continuous journey of pruning, cutting of my sinful nature in bearing fruit, a fruit that lasts and receive a word from our Heavenly Father, my daughter Maria Elma, good faithful servant, will done to God be the glory. Let's read in Ephesians 5 verse 2. It says, And the walk in the way of love, just as Christ loved us, and gave himself up for us as a fragrance offering and sacrifice to God. Our journey as a disciple certainly is not an easy. We face challenges, test our faith, our integrity, and most of all, our ability to love. We try numer numerous times to achieve what is right in God's eyes. Sometimes we succeed, sometimes we don't. And for many times we fail. We allow invalidation for ourselves to take over our heart, causing us to stray farther away from Him during times where we need Him the most. But brothers and sisters, let's remind ourselves that our imperfectness is why we need Christ all the more. Christ's death on the cross reminds us of His love and the sacrifice made for us so that He may restore us by bringing ourselves closer to Him. Let, let's not dwell in our self-pity for Christ did not die on the cross to condemn us but to save us our sins so that we may glorify Him. Let's accept the grace that God has freely given us through the death of His Son. Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, the author and perfector of faith. Let's pray. Uh, Father God in heaven, God, uh, truly God is so grateful and thankful, God, for, for your son, Jesus Christ, Father God. And uh, we're so thankful, God, that uh, Jesus Christ was uh, paid our sins, Father Lord, that we, we will not suffer, God, what Jesus Christ did, Father God. God, this morning, I just I just want to pray for our communion, Father God, to, uh, to please sing aroma to you, Father God. God, thank you. We love you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Your sacrifice, your, your awesome. 
delighting can be very frightening, but God is in control. Anchor for the soul, shelter from the storm. Manna in the morning, blessings overflowing, leading us to brothers and sisters. I have had the opportunities to meet up with many of you over the last few weeks. It's really true that these rare fellowship times are sweeter and warmer. Many testify that the pandemic has only made people closer to each other. This is a victory we ought to celebrate. Nonetheless, the pandemic continues and we see how little control we have over life. We feel so frail against something so microscopic. God is steering mankind towards some direction but it's a direction only discernible to those who hear the voice of the Holy Spirit. Our battle against COVID is very sobering. Just thinking of the uncertain days ahead should bring, that, should bring us down to our knees and crush whatever traces of arrogance still left within our spirit. With or without the pandemic, life is never without trouble, but we can overcome troubles with humility. Today we'll tackle Psalm 90, the prayer of Moses. We will hear how a humble man prays. Moses was the most accomplished Jewish leader, a friend of God with whom God spoke face to face. Moses lived a full life of 120 years, a life of glorious victories and sad defeats, joys and sorrows. Let us now read the words of a humble spirit, a spirit of surrender and trust. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn people back to dust, saying, Return to dust, you mortals. A thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. Yet you sweep people away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. In the morning it springs up new, but by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. 
Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. May your deeds be shown to your servants, your splendor to their children. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. From these words of Moses, I want to highlight several points. First, our beginning is God. Verse 2 reads, Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Take note of how Moses began his prayer. He acknowledges his roots and acknowledges the origin of the universe. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Moses' opening lines echo the very first words of Genesis. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The Gospel of John also explains how simple the act of creation was. In the beginning was the word. In other words, God simply spoke into existence all of us and the entire creation. To the materialist out there, the beginning of everything was nothing physical or material. God spoke and everything came to be. We are creatures made by a creator. That's the truth that must be embraced before one can aspire for true wisdom. Expectedly, this is rejected and denied by the loudest voices in society today, the extreme liberals, the socialists, atheists, and godless scientists. Even when scientific experiments point to the necessity of an intelligent designer, they'd rather believe that the universe created itself rather than welcome the idea of having a creator. You see, at the very heart of this foolish rejection of God is man's rebellion. It is deeply against man's pride to welcome someone in charge of the universe other than him. Man wants to be the final authority. If push comes to shove, man will bow down to idols because at least idols are created by him. Gods that he can easily reshape or manipulate if need be. But no, man won't bow down to a God that transcends him. But you brothers and sisters, must stick to the truth and preach it. The beginning of everything is God. Because God made everything, only God knows and understands the whys and hows of life's mysteries. Figuring out life's deepest questions has given impetus to the endless formulations of more philosophical teachings. But many famous philosophers themselves died lonely without having figured out their own life's meaning and their final destination. It was not possible because they could not accept their low status as creatures. Brothers and sisters, your many victories came by God. Your miseries and troubles were allowed by Him as well. He gives you and denies you things because He knows you through and through. If someone judges your child, don't you parents go on the defensive and say, if anyone knows my child, it's me? We knew our children from birth and raised them. We know their spirit. We discern their ways. We know the ugly and the beautiful about them. Many of their traits came straight from us by genetics and by modeling. We know how they tick. How much more God? God was there before there was any beginning. Removing God from your life means losing the very essence of your existence. You will wander around aiming for goals you were never made for. You will sway with the winds until you are fully lost and your soul malnourished. Whereas children need their parents less as they get older, our need for God should only increase with time. Sadly, most of us treat God the way we treat our parents. When we could stand already on our own feet, did not many of us start to take our parents for granted? When we stopped depending on our parents for food, we, all, we also slowly stopped asking guidance from them. In fact, we started believing we know the world better than our parents because their mentality is outdated. In the same way, when we can attain or achieve things on our own, we have a fine way of deposing God and taking over the throne. God is the beginning and therefore is the very meaning of life. Building your life without consideration of where, you're, of where, of where you began is vanity. Remember, in the beginning, God. Secondly, we will return to dust. You turn people back to dust, saying, return to dust, you mortals. Every creature returns to dust. Even the godless know that. Regardless of status, beauty, power, or fame, 
Everyone is dust and will return to dust. God declares to Adam in Genesis 3.19, Remember that you are dust, and to dust you shall return. Oh, how billboards and televisions have made us enamored with physical beauty. Celebrities are so glorified, it makes us forget that this movie, TV, and sports idols have the same dusty origin and dusty ending. God continues to enforce today the judgment he pronounced upon Adam when he fell in the garden. Around the world, God ends the lives of an average 150,000 people every day. That's around 55 million people returning to dust every year. Have you observed lately the flowers and grass around you? You see them one day green and colorful, yet tomorrow or the next day they're gone. Just like many of our dear ones. Many people who had shared space and moments with us are no more. A few nights ago, I streamed in my mind images of departed loved ones. I felt a piercing in my heart, realizing that I have no more grandparents, no more father. All my six uncles and aunts on my father's side of the family are no more. I even recalled friends so much younger than me who died away too early. All of us will tread the same path. We are strong today, frail tomorrow. Young and smooth today, gray and wrinkled tomorrow. And although the years make us wrinkled, wrinkled should not mean ugly. Some of the most beautiful souls in the world are old people. All Christians should expect their spirit to grow more vigorous as the body deteriorates. In the seniors ministry of our church, they have an easier time fighting materialism, arrogance, and vanity. These old people are pretty much done with the world. Their desire is for heaven. But you are still younger. You, you are, who are in your teens or twenties or strong in your thirties. You hardly ponder in life's brevity. You believe you have many years ahead of you. You're strongly driven by the fire of ambition and life's thrills. I say, enjoy your strength and talents while young. But don't, let, don't get overzealous pleasing yourself. Take time to pause and learn at the feet of those who are older and wiser. They can guide you so you can avoid wasting time on, on things and pursuits which you will find meaningless anyway in the end. You've got pro bono counselors in the church who will speak wisdom to you and share lessons from their failures and victories. The future of everyone, rich and poor, is the same. All return to dust. That's the inescapable we ought to prepare for. So don't cringe at discussing death. If you don't ponder death or discuss it often enough, you might reach your end unprepared. Thirdly, acknowledge God's discipline. Starting from verse 7, we read, We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. I believe God periodically meets out discipline upon mankind as a whole and upon individuals in particular, but we fail to recognize it. If we do, we receive God's discipline with a bad attitude. Others even deny the very concept of God disciplining people. Still others try everything they can to escape it. By definition, divine discipline entails pain and sorrow. Doesn't Hebrew 12.11 clearly explain? No discipline seems pleasant at that time, but painful. Moses knew this too well. Moses himself experienced God's discipline. Moses also became the harbinger of God's discipline upon the whole nation of Israel. Moses saw God afflict the whole nation multiple times and how people languished under God's stringent discipline. Moses must have recalled these painful episodes when he wrote verses, verses 9 to 10. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. Our days may come to 70 years or 80 if our strength endures, yet the best of them are but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Our public and secret sins are laid bare before God. God knows the weaknesses and illnesses of our soul. Thus, it is most loving of Him to impose discipline upon us as children. Discipline is an essential component of divine parenting. Only discipline can correct our skewed character and train us towards godliness. But don't even think for a moment that God treats us as our sins deserve. I believe even the many expressions of God's wrath upon the world is mostly tempered. God continues to offer chances upon chances for people to correct their ways and find the good old path. Should God decide to punish every error and sin as deserved, 
All of mankind will disintegrate in one instant. That happened once, during the time of Noah. On a smaller scale, God repeated such judgment upon Sodom and Gomorrah. Through divine discipline, God trains us to discern quickly the good from the bad. But the question is, do we bother to know if we are under God's discipline? Or do we view all our troubles and challenges as mere opportunities to improve our problem-solving skills? Exclude the concept of divine discipline and life becomes all about problem-solving and not about developing godly character. Hence, people who can solve problems quickly or avoid troubles altogether are admired by the world regardless of the kind of character they develop along the way. Moses says in verse 11, If only we knew the power of your anger, your wrath is as great as the fear that is your due. To be in awe of God's power, specifically the power of his anger, will help us submit to God's discipline. I say to us, let us make every effort to always reserve holy fear towards God. Don't get overly familiar with God, lest we start believing that He is just like us. That will only cause us to be contemptuous towards God. God is holy and so is His discipline. Let us discern and submit to God's discipline. We will reap a harvest of godliness, proof that indeed we are being groomed for heaven. Fourth, life's brevity imparts wisdom. Verse 12 reads, Teach us to number our days, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. When planning your life to say, I have 20 more years, 30, 40, 50, 60 years, truth is, you don't know. Often, whatever you declare about your tomorrow is mere presumption based on pride. Learn to measure time with soberness and you will be wise. When planning your life, Consider that life is both short and fleeting. Don't ever be too sure that time is in your hands, even if you're young. Time never was and will never be in your hands. No one, absolutely no one, has ever successfully stopped the hands of time. No man has ever extended his life beyond what was destined. Your appointed departure, whether sooner or later than others, will not be revealed to you until the angel of death pulls the plug. Time and again, confess the words of scriptures, I am a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes. As the verse reads, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. In other words, a humble estimation of our short days on earth is crucial for gaining wisdom. Confessing we don't have a hold of today and tomorrow will effectively keep our feet on the ground and our knees bended in surrender, a spiritual posture very pleasing to God. I believe Moses did not only have the span of a man's life in view here. I believe he also wants us to realize that every chapter we begin has an end. Every relationship given us has an allotted time. Every door that opens also closes. It is God who puts us in the exact place at the exact time, places and timings which only He determines. For instance, how wise it is to plan a garden wedding in summer. Well, it rained on our wedding day. It only proved that even summer wasn't in charge of its own season. It is God who sets the time for the sunshine and the rain. How many relationships we thought we'd enjoy for longer were cut short by unexpected relocations, conflicts, or death? We thought we had the time. How many of us thought we'd have the time to say sorry or I love you to a loved one, but time simply ran out? I thought all along my father would be thriving into the 90s, but I was wrong. He was gone at 8 to 7 years old, two days before Christmas last year, a dramatic timing I would not have imagined, even if I were the most creative scriptwriter. If only I had learned to number the days humbly, I would have had the wisdom to rearrange my schedule and give time for my father. Fit. Don't tire appealing for mercy. Relent, Lord. How long will it be? Have compassion on your servants. Although divine discipline follows us every step of the way, don't think God is unfeeling towards us. In fact, God's discipline means love. Hebrews 12 can be clearer. God disciplines those he loves. As well, the many burdens too heavy for us to carry are great occasions for mercy. That's what they are purposed for. So let us appeal to God for mercy. Practice saying, God, have mercy on me. 
God, have compassion in your servant. If the weight of your problem is too much, pray and say, Relent, Lord, how long will it be? Moses prayed so. Why won't we? Or do you feel conflicted inside? Do you question it? If we are indeed his children, why would God act only upon hearing us beg for mercy? Do parents attend to their children only when they beg? Oh, indeed we are God's children, but it is only fitting that we feel small in front of a holy God. We are human. He is divine. It is proper that we humble ourselves and exalt God. For how can we truly worship someone we cannot exalt to the utmost? And you cannot exalt to the utmost without absolutely abasing yourself. Do not tire appealing for mercy. Our confidence is in knowing God is merciful. Remember how God showed mercy even to the succeeding generations of those who loved and served him? I believe many of us with Christian heritage received grace and mercy from God as direct answers to the appeals made by our Christian ancestors. Also, remember that everyone who came to Jesus begging received. The only exceptions were those who approached Jesus without giving up their confidence in self or the world. Daily appealing for mercy is best for growing humility. Kneeling down humbly is a spiritual posture that makes pride uncomfortable. Do it more, kneel down more often, and pride will have no recourse but to surrender and flee from our spirit. 6. Believe in God's love. Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Make us glad for as many days as you have afflicted us, for as many years as we have seen trouble. Despite Moses' lament about the heavy discipline of God over his people, he knew that God's unfailing love can be experienced daily. Yes, it is possible to sing with joy and overflow with gladness amidst our trials and travails. I believe only Christians have a grasp of this irony of feeling loved while being afflicted. And it's God's unfailing love that makes this experience possible. God's love is so unlike human love. Human love diminishes over time, gets eroded by disappointments, sways with the seasons, and dances with unreliable emotions. In contrast, God's love is constant, faithful, a solid rock of refuge that will be there come hell or high water. And that divine love is committed to us by God, guaranteed by Jesus' blood poured out at Calvary. This is why, despite Israel's many afflictions on their way to the Promised Land, Moses could appeal to God, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. Moses trusted that God's love is constant and abiding, a love unshaken by trials. As the scriptures say, Troubles cannot separate us from the love of God which is ours in Christ Jesus. The confusion happens when doubt sips in, when you start thinking that the presence of troubles in your life is a sure proof of the absence of God's love. May I ask you for a moment to recall some of your life's darkest chapters? Pick one or two. In those challenging moments, did you not experience that peace that passes understanding? Did not the Holy Spirit assure your spirit that God was in charge? Most likely, you prayed and praised God instead of hating Him. That brother, that sister, is your personal testimony about divine love. God's love abided in you and never left you. In view of this, let us acknowledge that discipline is an, ex is an expression of God's love, and divine love is never without discipline. Believe in God's love. And seven, be assured of victory. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us. Establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. Trying to thrive in a sluggish environment is difficult. And with social distancing, you could very well be scrambling to survive alone. But whatever your situation, brother or sister, remember you've got an ace up your sleeve. When there's not a glimmer of hope, no help coming from friends and neighbors, there's a God who hears your laments and groans. God is the one who will bless your efforts even if you lack the ingredients for success. So are you in a situation where no company wants you? You feel unwanted, no calls for interview, no open doors. Are you wanting to start a venture but no one believes, no one loans you a capital or helps you get started? Or maybe you've started a venture but the pandemic denies you of customers or even prospects. 
in your personal journey? Do you feel alone with no one to share your burden or pick you up when you stumble? Remember this, there is a God who will grow the smallest seeds you faithfully plant. There is a God who hears the prayers you can only quietly whisper. Here in the Middle East, we are all too familiar with desert plants. We see no reason for their growth except that God helps them thrive in the driest conditions. In the same way, through the driest seasons of your life, put your hope in God and you will overcome. You're worth much more to God than desert plants. Just believe and God will fill up what you're lacking. But make sure you've got diligent hands and active feet. God does not bless the lazy. And most importantly, pray like Moses did. Say, God, establish the work of our hands for us. Yes, establish the work of our hands. But to you who think you got everything, you got a good plan, acknowledge still your need to be blessed. Don't be like the farmer who procured everything he needed for a successful harvest, but for God to pray for the sunshine and the rain. Know how small you are and seek the favor of the only one who can bless. If you acknowledge God and acknowledge how small you are in the overall scheme of things and you humbly number your days, that humility will make God accompany you on your journey and no blessing is greater than God walking with you. Moses led the Israelites 40 years in the desert, but as a consequence of his sin, God kept him from stepping into the promised land. At the age of 120, Moses climbed up Mount Nebo to die just after seeing the promised land only from a distance. A truly humble man whose joy was to do the will of God. So let us remember what Moses teaches us in Psalm 90. Our beginning is God. We will return to dust. Acknowledge God's discipline. Life is short. Don't tire appealing for God's mercy. Believe in God's love and be assured of victory. God bless you all and to God be morning to everyone. We are so grateful to God for giving us the privilege to respond on the message of God that was preached for us. First, we want to thank Angelo and Gigi for the opening and welcome part of our worship service. Thank you also to Francis and Elma for leading us to the cross in the communion with our Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you so much, Andrew for the inspiring and convicting message that you have preached, the powerful prayer of Moses. Moses was described as a very humble man, more humble man than anyone else on the face of the earth. This pandemic has taught us to rely on God more because of life's uncertainty. Some of us have been tested positive in COVID-19 and experienced being isolated from our loved ones and some have lost their parents, brothers and sisters, and was not able to go home. A lot of us uh, have lost their jobs and cannot provide financial help to the family back home. Thus, the prayer of Moses can become a great inspiration in our lives. It can motivate us on our difficult situations in our lives. Brothers and sisters, let us ask ourselves and reflect on this Psalm 90, the prayer of Moses. In his prayer, it shows his wisdom in life through his lifelong experience with God and with the Israelites that he led. Through his prayer, we can learn how we need to be humble and rely on the sustenance of our Creator each day. We all don't know when is the end of our lives. Only God knows who is our beginning and our hand, and is the only one who holds our life. He knows what is the best for all of us, and because He loves us and He cares for us. 
Thank you so much again, Andrew, for the seven points that you shared with us today, which are our beginning is God. We will return to dust. Acknowledge the God's discipline. Life is short. Don't tire appealing for mercy. Believe in God's love. Be assured of victory. For our guide on our group discussion later, we can answer these questions. Which of the seven points that convicted you the most, and why? How is your prayer life lately? Are you patient and hopeful, or you discouraged and feeling doubtful? If God will grant your prayers. For our announcements, first, our brother would like to share a few words about the upcoming event. Singles Retreat on the 23rd and 24th of September. Facing a lot of struggles in your life, feels like you're tired, trained, losing hope, and about to lose your life. It's about time to have a break. My name is Jonathan Balesteros. Join us on this upcoming GCC Singles Retreat that will be held on 23 to 24 of September 2021 via Zoom, and it will be a great opportunity to meet our guest speakers, to learn from them on how to face and overcome our situations, and to reclaim ourselves on what's God's purpose to us. See you there. Singles Retreat Made to Overcome is on September 24th. Registration is now open. Marriage also can invite your single friends and colleagues. On Friday, September 17th, we will have our Zoom meeting worship service. Kindly note that the last week of every month will be house church, Friday, September 24th. Worship service will be by house churches or small groups. Teens and kids kingdom classes will have their normal meetings this afternoon. Bible talk leaders will have their meeting this afternoon at 3 p.m. till 4 p.m. On September 14th, Tuesday, each of our group will meet for the midweek. If you are visiting with us today, please inquire with the person who joined you about our midweek meeting. Special contribution will be collected this first week of October. Regular monthly contributions can be handed in your respective finance representative or your Bible talk leaders. Uphold each other in prayer, especially those affected by COVID-19. Stay indoors as much as possible and keep safe. Let us bow down and pray. Holy Father, our God, we come before you with a humble heart. We seek your guidance, Lord. Please help us to learn more of your great and wonderful decrees so we may follow you till the end. Give us understanding so we may Obey you with all our hearts. Direct us to the path of your commands. Turn our hearts toward your statutes and that not toward the selfish gain. Turn our eyes away from worthless things. 
and preserve our life according to your word. May your unfailing love come to us, Lord, for your salvations according to your promise. Thank you so much for your son, Jesus, who gave up his everything for us because of his love and your love for us. Continue to protect us and comfort those who were affected by this pandemic. We praise you, Lord. We love you. And we pray all this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen.